Loengu professor Umberto Eko sellest, kuidas tema kirjutab. Please, professor Umberto Eko, the floor is yours. Yeah. Dear friends, <clears throat> so uh, I have decided at the last moment to, to, to select this title because before it was given another one, but I, then I decided that this was better for a larger audience. Uh, and I gave a, a similar lecture last year in a series of lectures in America entitled Confessions of a Young Writer. Uh, because I started writing my first novel at the end of the, at the, end of the 70s, uh, so there are less than 30 years that I am a writer. So I am a young, a young writer. As a young writer, I have the right to tell you tentatively how I write. Uh, so I discover myself. My, I began to write novels uh, during during my childhood, but uh, I began by writing the title, usually inspired to the adventure books of that time, the Pirates of the Caribbean, uh, the Phantom Ship, and I made immediately all the illustrations. Then I commenced the first chapter, but since I tried to imitate the real books and I wrote in block capital letters, after a few pages, I felt uh, exhausted, and I stopped. Thus, each of my works uh, was an unfinished masterpiece, uh, like Schubert's. At uh, 16, I obviously started to write uh, poems, like everybody else. I do not remember whether it was the need for poetry and the contemporary discovery of Chopin that caused the flowering of my first platonic and unconfessed love, or vice versa. The mixture was a disaster, as it happens to everybody. But once I have written, even though under the form of a paradox uttered by one of my fictional characters, that there are two kinds of poets. The good ones burn their poems at the age of 18. The bad ones keep writing poetry for the rest of their lives. Excuse me, but it was one of my characters who said so, and then my model was Rambo. Until the age of 58, I didn't feel frustrated, as it happened to many scholars, by the fact that I didn't perform a so-called creative writing. I felt uh, totally fulfilled being a philosopher and a semiotician. As a matter of fact, I now realize that I was satisfying my passion for narrative in three different ways. First of all, by a constant performance of oral narrativity, uh, telling stories to my children so that I felt paralyzed when they grew up and shifted from fairy tales to rock music. Uh, secondly, uh, by playing with literary parodies and pastiche of various types, a period documented in my misreadings, if somebody knows it, written between the end of the 1950s and the beginning of the 60s. And thirdly, by making a narrative of uh, out of every of my essays, when I presented my doctoral dissertation on the aesthetics of Thomas Aquinas, a very controversial subject indeed, since at that time it was usually maintained that there were no aesthetic reflections in the immense opus of Aquinas, one of my examiners charged me with a sort of narrative fallacy. He said that a major scholar, when beginning a research, certainly proceeds by trial and error making and rejecting different hypotheses, but at the end of the inquiry, all those attempts should have been digested and only the conclusions should be presented. 
On the contrary, I told, so to speak, the story of my research, as if it were a detection novel. The objection was made in a friendly way, and, and the same professor later published my thesis, such as it was, in a philosophical series he was editing. In any case, I wasn't disturbed by this remark, because I was strongly convinced that every research must be narrated in the same way. Every scientific book must be a sort of whodunit, or the report of a quest for some holy grail. And I think I have done so in all my subsequent academic works. At the beginning of 78, <clears throat> a friend of mine working for a small publisher told me that she was asking non-novelists, like philosophers, sociologists, politicians, and so on, uh, to write a short detection story. For the reasons I have just told, I reacted by saying that I was not interested in creative writing, that I was convinced to be absolutely unable to write good dialogues, and I don't know why, I conclude provocatively by saying that if I had to write a criminal novel, it would have been at least 500 pages long, taking place in a medieval monastery. My friend said, okay, she was not fishing for miscarried bestseller, and our meeting stopped there. As soon as I returned home, I browsed in a drawer and I retrieved a note on one year before where I had written the names of a series of monks. It means that in the most secret part of my soul, the idea of a novel was already growing up, but I didn't know it. At that moment, I realized that it would have been nice to poison a monk. While he, was, uh, reading a, while he was reading a mysterious book. And that was all. Uh, then I started to write The Name of the Rose. Later, I have repeatedly been asked why I decided to write a novel, and all the answers I gave, one different from the other, according to my mood at that moment, were probably all true, what means that they were all false. At the end, I realized that the only correct answer was that at a certain moment of my life, I felt the, the wish to do that. And I think that is a sufficient and reasonable explanation. When interviews ask me, how did you write your novels? I usually cut them short and reply, from left to right. If I were a Jew, I would write on the opposite things. Uh, I understand that, as an answer, this is not satisfactory. First of all, because it produced some astonishment in Arab countries and in Israel. But today, I have time for a more articulated reply. By writing my first novel, I learned something. First, inspiration is a bad word and tricky authors use it in order to look artistically respectable. As a famous quotation says, genius is 10% inspiration and 90% perspiration. It is told that the French poet Lamartine spoke many times of the circumstances in which he wrote one of his best poems, and he said that it happened by a sudden illumination during a night when he was wandering in the woods. After his death, somebody found in his drawers an impressive quantity of versions of that poem written and rewritten in the course of the years. The first uh, critics that wrote about uh, the name of the rose said it was written under the pressure of a luminous inspiration, but that, because of its conceptual and linguistic difficulties, it was only for the happy few. When the book got a certain success, printing some million copies, the same critics wrote that in order to concoct such a popular and entertaining bestseller, I probably followed mechanically a secret recipe. Moreover, they say the, later that the secret of that success was due to the maneuver of my computer, not considering 
that the first personal computers with a feasible writing program appeared only at the beginning of the 80s when my novel was already in print. The name of the rose took me only two years for the simple reasons that I had not to make any research on the Middle Ages, as I said. My doctoral dissertation was on the medieval aesthetics. After that, I devoted all the studies to the Middle Ages. During the years, I made many trips through a lot of Romanesque abbeys and Gothic cathedrals and so on and so forth. So when I decided to write the novel, I was like I had opened a big closet that where I was piling up since uh, decades uh, my medieval files. All that material rushed to my feet and I had only to select what I needed. For the following novels it was different, even though it is obvious that if I selected a given subject it was because I already had some familiarity with it. This is why the following novel took a lot of time, namely eight years for the Foucault's Pendulum, six for the island of the day before, as well for Baudolino, only four for the mysterious flame of Queen Loana, because it deals with my readings as a child in the 30s and in the 40s. And also in this case, I had a lot of old material, comic strips, records, magazines, and newspapers in my nostalgia and trivia collection. What do I do? What did I do during these years of literary pregnancy? I collect documents. I visit places, designing their map, I outline the section of the buildings, or in the case of the island of the day before, the structure of the ship, and I sketch the faces of the characters, so that for the name of the rose I had the portraits of all the monks I had to mention. I spent those years in a sort of enchanted castle, or if you prefer, in an autistic situation. Nobody knows what I'm doing, not even the members of my family. I give the impression of doing a lot of different things, but I am always capturing ideas, images, words for my story. I mean that if while writing on the Middle Ages, I remark a car passing on the street, and I am perhaps impressed by its color, I record that experience in my notebook, or simply my mind, and that color will play later a role in the description, let's say, of a miniature. For Foucault's pendulum, I spent days walking evening after evening, right through the closing time, in the Conservatoire des Arts et Métiers, where some of the, my events of my story took place. In order to speak of the Templars, I went to visit the Forêt d'Orient in France, where there are the traces of their commanderie which are referred to in the novel in a few vague allusions. To describe Casabon's night a walk through Paris from the Conservatoire to Place de Vosges and then to the Eiffel, Eiffel II Tower, I spent various nights between 2 p.m. 2 a.m. and 3 a.m. walking, dictating into a pocket tape recorder everything I could see, so as not to get the street names and intersection wrong. Uh, then uh, 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 a reader wrote to me, but you didn't mention that at the corner of Rue Ramur, that night there was an enormous fire. The miserable went back in the collection of the newspaper uh, of that year to control if uh, I, I answered that if my character didn't confess this event, there was probably one mystery more in my story. For the island of the day before, naturally I went to the South Seas to, to the precise geographical location where the book is set to see the colors of the sea, the sky, the fishes and the corals the various hours of the day. 
But I also worked for two or three years uh, drawing, drawing models of ships of the period to find uh, out how big a cabin or a cubby hole was and how one could move from one to another. After the publication of The Name of the Rose, the first movie director who proposed me, proposed me to make a film out of it was Marco Ferreri. He told me, your book seems just conceived for a movie script, since the dialogues last exactly what they should. Uh, at the beginning, I didn't understand why. Then I realized that before writing, I drew hundreds of labyrinths and plans of the Abbey, so that I knew how long it would take two characters to go in a conversation from one place to another. Thus, the format of my world dictated the length of the dialogues. I learned as thus that a novel is not just a linguistic phenomenon, like poetry or other forms of art. A novel, like every other kind of narrative, uses words, which in poetry are so difficult to translate because what also counts there is their sound, to convey the narrated facts. While in poetry it is the choice of words that determines the content, in narrative it is the opposite. It is the universe the author has built up, as well as the event that happens in it, that dictates rhythm, style, and even verbal choices. In narrative holds the Latin norm, rem tene, verba sequentu, stick to the subject and the words will follow, while in poetry we should change it as stick to the words and the subject will follow. Narrative is, first of all, a cosmological affair. To narrate something, you start as a sort of demiurge who creates a, a world. And this world has to be as precise as possible so that you can move around, in it, around it and in it with a total confidence. I follow this norm to such an extent that, for instance, when in the Foucault's pendulum I say that the two publishing houses of Manuzio and Garamond are in two different but adjoining buildings between which a passage had been opened, I spend a long time drawing several plans and working out how that passage looked like and whether there had to be some steps to compensate the difference of level. In the novel, then, I simply mention once some steps. The reader takes them without paying too much attention, I believe. But for me, they were crucial. And without designing them, I would have been unable to go on with my story. I have been told that Lucchino Visconti, if in one of his movies two characters had to talk about a box full of jewels, even though the box was never opened, he wanted real jewels to be there. Otherwise, the actor would have performed with less conviction. The readers of the pendulum are not supposed to know exactly the plan of the publishing house offices. I mean that if the structure of the world as the background world is set to set events and characters of the story is fundamental for the writer, frequently it must remain imprecise for the reader. In the name of the rose, on, on the contrary, there is in the, at the opening of the book a plan of the Abbey. This is in some way a bookish reference to many detection novels that display the plan of the guilty vicarage, as well as a sort of ironic mark of realism to pretend to prove that the Abbey really existed. But I also wanted my readers to realize clearly what happened to my characters when they were moving through the monastery. On the contrary, after the publication of The Island of the Day Before, my German published asked me if it was not worthwhile included with the novel A Plan of the Ship. Notice that 
I had this plan since I spent a lot of time to design it carefully, exactly as I did with the plan of the Abbey for the name of the rose. But for the island, I wanted the reader to be confused, as well as the hero, who is unable to find his way in the labyrinth of that ship and frequently explore it after generous alcoholic libations. Thus, I needed to bamboozle my reader's ideas while having my own ones very clear. So to write always referring to the spaces that were calculated down to the last millimeter. And so I asked the German publisher not to publish uh, the plan, otherwise I would have called my lawyer. Another frequently asked question is, which, with which rough idea or detailed plan in your mind you, do you start writing? It was only after my third novel that I fully realized that uh, all my novels stemmed from a seminal idea that was little more than an image. I wrote in the reflection on the name of the rose that I started because I wanted to poison a monk. In fact, I didn't want to poison any monk, and indeed, I have never done so. I mean, neither monks nor secular people. I was simply struck by the image of a monk poisoned while reading a book. Perhaps I was remembering the experience I had at the age of 16 when visiting a Benedictine monastery, Santa Scholastica, at Subiaco, I walked among medieval cloisters and went into a dark library where, open on a lectern, I found the Acta Sanctorum, and there I learned that there was not just one blessed Umberto, as I had been led to believe, but with a feast day on March 4, but also a Saint Umberto, a bishop, whose feast was celebrating on September 6, and, and who had converted a lion in a forest. So I asked my parents to, to, to change uh, the date of my festivity. I created a confusion, and so I never had any, uh, any celebration of my uh, name during that, no, nor neither in March nor in September. Uh, if you calculated that I am born on January 5th and I had no gift because they said tomorrow there will be the kings to bring uh, the, the gift, you know, what a terrible uh, childhood I had. Uh, uh, where is it? Probably while I was leafing through that folio volume opened vertically in front of me, in deep silence, amidst beams of light entering through the stained windows, I felt something like a thrill. More than 40 years later, that thrill emerged from my unconscious where it was imprisoned. That was a seminal image. The rest came bit by bit in order to make sense of that image. And it came, came of its own, gradually, as I rummaged to 25 years old filing cards on the Middle Ages, which had been filled out for completely different purposes. With Foucault's pendulum, things were a little more complicated. After having written The Name of the Rose, which was my first novel, and I was a young writer, I had the impression to have put in my first and maybe last novel everything that I, even indirectly, I could say about myself. Because even if you speak of somebody else, you always tell something about yourself. What, was there anything else that was truly my own and that I could narrate? While mentally mumbling this way, two images came to my, to my mind. The first was that of the pendulum, which I had seen for the first time 30 years before in Paris, and that made a huge impression on me. 
to such an extent that when in the 60s I had been asked by a film director to write a script for a film, I imagined a scene that took place in a cavern at the center of which hung a pendulum and someone was clinging to it as he fenced in the darkness. Then my script was not used. The film became something else. I was, I was happy to have nothing to do uh, with uh, a movie that looked uh, as director by Ed Wood. The second image was of myself playing a trumpet at the funeral of partisans. A true story, which besides I had never stopped telling because I found it beautiful. I mean narratively beautiful. Also because when later I read Joyce, I was fully aware to have experienced that day an epiphany. Thus, I decided to tell a story, starting with the pendulum and ending with a little trumpeter in a cemetery in a sunny morning. But how to get from the pendulum to the trumpet? I didn't know. To answer this question took me eight years. And the answer was the novel. With the island of the day before, I started from a question made by a French journalist. Why do you describe spaces so well? I had never paid attention to my description of space. But by reflecting on that question, I realized what I have said before. Namely, that if you design a world, you also know how to describe it in terms of space, since you have it under your eyes. There was a classical literary genre called ekphrasis, which consisted in describing so carefully a given image, a painting or a statue, that even those who had never seen it could see it as it was before their eyes. As Addison said in The Pleasures of the Imagination, words, when well chosen, have so great a force in them that a description often gives us more lively ideas than the sight of the things themselves. It is said that when the Laocoon was discovered in Rome in 1506, they recognized it as the famous Greek statue because of the verbal description provided by Pliny the Elder, Pliny the Elder in his uh, Naturalis Historia. Why not? Then, to tell a story where space played a more important role. Moreover, I told myself in my first two novels, I have spoken too much about monasteries and museums that is about closed cultural space. I should try to write about open natural spaces. And where to find enormous spaces, nature and nothing else? By placing my hero on a desert island. At the same time, I saw in the showcase of a clockmaker one of those world time watches which tell the local time in every place of the world and display a sign indicating the international date line on the 180th meridian. Everybody knows that that line exists because everybody has read at least a Jules Verne's around the world in 80 days, but we do not think of it so frequently. Well, my protagonist had to be the west of that line and to see an island to the east where it was a day before. Thus it had, it had to be shipwrecked, not on the island itself, but on a boat in face of it, unable to swim, so to be condemned to watch an island distant in space and time. Since my clock, that I immediately bought, showed that this fated point, the Aleutian Islands, I didn't know what, why to place someone there to do something. It's like to choose a, a, a vice president in, in Alaska, uh, as it happened recently in, in the United States. Uh, where was my hero? shipwrecked on an oil rig platform with uh, 35 degrees under zero. 
Since when I am writing about a place, I must to be there, and the idea of going to such cold place didn't fascinate me at all. As I continue, however, to live through the atlas, I discovered that the line also passed through the Fijian archipelago, the southern Pacific Islands, very worst Stevensonian. Many of these lands were discovered in the 17th century. I knew pretty well the Baroque culture. It was the time of the Three Musketeers and of Richelieu, great. I had only to start and then the novel could walk on its own feet. Once the narrative world has been designed, the worlds will follow and they will be those that that world requires. For these reasons, the, still, the style in the name of the rose is that of a medieval chronicler, precise, naive, flat when necessary. A humble 14th century monk doesn't write like Joyce or doesn't remember things like Proust. Not only, but since I assume to transcribe from a 19th century translation of a medieval text, the stylistic model was only indir indirectly the Latin of the chroniclers of that time, but directly the style of the modern translator. I remember to have told the English uh, translator, buy the Penguin edition of Medieval Chronicles and follow that uh, style. In the Foucault's pendulum, a plurality of languages had to come into play. A character like Callier is, has an educated and archaic, archaic language. Colonel Ardenti, a pseudo-Danunzian, a fascist uh, style. The disenchanted and ironic literary language of Belbo's secret files is really postmodern in his hysterical use of literary quotation. Garamond, the publisher, has a, has a kitsch style. And in the body dialogues of three editors during their irresponsible fantasies, I had to mix learned reference with the sophomoric puns. What uh, Maria Corti, great Italian critic, who is no more with us, uh, define uh, those styles as, as lips of register, let's say continuous jumps from lower to higher uh, style. And she was right, but it didn't depend on a simple stylistic choice, but was determined by the nature of the world in which the event took place in which I had sophomores and kernels, uh, publishers and uh, other people. For the island of the day before, it was the cultural period that determined not just the style, but the very structure of the constant dialogue between narrator and character, while the reader is continually appealed to us uh, a witness and accomplice in that conflict. This sort of meta-narrative choice was due to the fact that my characters were supposed to talk in a Baroque way, though I myself, as a narrator, couldn't. So then I had to have a narrator who at times gets irritated with the verbal excesses of his characters, at times becomes their victim, Times he tempers these excesses by apologizing with the reader. Up until now, I have said that one starts with the seminal idea and that the construction of the narrative world determines the style. My fourth experience in fiction, Baudolino, in a way contradicted these two principles. As for the seminal idea, for at least two years, I had, him, I had many uh, ideas. And if there are too many seminal ideas, it's a sign that they are no seminal, not seminal. One among these ideas was, which can banally be connected with the topos of a murder in a closed room. But if you read the novel, you will see that I use that topos only in the chapter of Frederick Barbarossa's death. 
The second idea was that the final scene should take place amidst the mummified corpse of the Capuchins Church in Palermo. And in fact, I had been there several times and taken many photographs of those uh, hundreds of mummies, marvelous. If you go to Palermo, go to the Capuchin Cemetery. This idea is finally exploited only in a chapter, but it has only a marginal function in the economy of the novel. The third idea was that the novel was to be about a group of forgers. And I had dealt with the semiotics of the fakes on several occasions. Then I remember that one of the most successful fakes in the Western history was the letter of Prester Joan, telling of a remote blessed land full of precious stones and amazing monsters. Then I realized that that letter, which was clearly a forgery, appeared in the Western world more or less at the time of the foundation of my native city, Alessandria, the Italian one, not the Egyptian one. And I remember that the legendary hero of the city, Galliaudo, when Frederick Barbarossa, the German emperor, was on the verge of conquering the newborn city, discouraged him by a malicious trick, a lie, a fraud. You want to know which one? Go to read the book. Any, anyway, the population in Alessandria was starving. There was nothing more to, to eat. And it remains on an old cow reduced to, to, to a skeleton. So Galliardo had the idea of collecting all the few grain and herbs they could find and to introduce uh, that uh, into the throat of that miserable cow that became, in a way, enormous. Then he brought the cow in the fields around the city. Immediately, the soldier of Barbarossa captured it, opened the cow, found it so full of food that Barbarossa was convinced that the city couldn't be taken because they had too much to eat for for months and months, and he abandoned, abandoned the, the siege. In fact, he won't abandon the siege between certain time, and since he was not so stupid, he found that was a, a good uh, pretext to, uh, to go away. Bon, it was the opportunity to return to my beloved Middle Ages, to my personal roots, I see, to my fascination for fakes, but it was not enough. I didn't know how to start, which kind of style to use, and who was my real hero. I knew only the name, Baudolino, because Baudolino is the saint protector of Alessandria, but that was the only link. I reflected on the fact that in that historical period in my native area, people did not speak any longer Latin, but rather new dialects that were in some way close to the Italian language was just in its cradle. But we don't have documents of the dialect spoken years in North East, uh, Eastern Italy. Thus, I felt free to invent a popular idiom, hypothetically 12th century about the Po Valley, a Po Valley pigeon. And I think I worked it out pretty well because a friend of mine who teaches history of the Italian language told me that even though nobody can neither confirm or challenge my invention, Baudolino's language was not so improbable. Terrible problem for the translators who had to reinvent the same language. Think of the English one, because he should have written it in Middle English. And no English reader is, is able to understand a single, single word. Think of the Japanese, who had a marvelous idea, not to use archaic words, but only archaic ideograms. So the teaching is visual and not auditory. Okay. 
This language, which gave no minor problems to my co courageous translator, suggested me the psychology of my protagonist, Baudolino, and made of my fourth novel a picaresque counterpoint to the name of the rose, since the latter was a story of intellectual talking in high style, whereas Baudolino was a tale about peasants, warrior, and impudent goliards. I must recognize, however, that Baudolino too depends on a first poignant image. For no reasonable reasons, since a long time I was fascinated by Constantinople, that I had never seen, I wanted to make the book start with the siege, with the conquest of Constantinople. Why? Because I had a good reason to go to Constantinople. To see the, the sea, as I had a good reason to go to the South Seas to see uh, what happened down there. So I went to Constantinople. I explored it on its surface and even underneath. And I had the start, starting image of my story. The city set on fire by the Crusaders in 1204. Take a Constantinople in flames, a young liar, a German emperor, some Asian monster from the letter of President John, and you have the novel. I didn't anything else. I admit that this doesn't look as a convincing recipe, but for me, it worked this way. I must add that by reading a lot about Byzantine culture, I discovered Niketa Koniates, a Greek historian of that period. I decided to tell the whole story as a report by Baudolino, a supposed liar to Niketas. And I also had my meta-narrative structure, that is a story in which not only Niketas, but even the narrator, and with him the reader, are never sure of what Baudolino is recounting. I said once that once found the seminal image, the story can go on by itself. This is true until a certain extent. In order to leave the story to go freely, the writer must impose some constraints. Constraints are fundamental in every artistic operation. A painter who decides to use oil rather than tempera, a canvas, rather than a wall, a composer who opts, opts for a given musical key, a poet who decides to use rhymes or endecasyllables rather than alexandrines, all of them set up a system of constraint. And also avant-garde artists who seem to avoid those constraints do construct order, even though no one notices them. To choose the seven trumpets of the apocalypse, apocalypse as a scheme for the succession of events, as it happens in the name of the rose, is a constraint. It is a constraint to set the story at a precise date, because you can make some things happen, but not others. It was a constraint to decide that, to imitate the occult obsession of some of my characters, the number of chapters in Foucault's pendulum had to be 120, no one more and no one less. And the story had to be divided in 10 parts, like the Sephiroth of the Kabbalah. Besides, one of the constraints of the pendulum was that the characters had to leave their student protest in 1968. But since Belbo then writes his files on a computer, we also play a formal role in the whole story since it in part inspires <laughs> its aleatory and combinator combinatorial nature. The final events could take place only at the beginning of the 80s and not before, because remember that I said that the first personal computers with word processing program, programs went on sale in Italy, but even in America, only between 1982 in 1983. But in order to make all that time elapse from 1968 
1983, it was a big hole. I didn't know what to do. Uh, I was forced to send Casobon somewhere else. Where? My memories of some magic ritual which I had witnessed there brought me back to Brazil, where I sat my hero, Casobon, for more than 10 years. Many found this a too long digression. But for me, uh, for some other benevolent readers, it was essential. Because what happens in Brazil is a sort of, of a hallucinated premonition of what would happen to my characters in the rest of the book. If IBM or Apple had started selling good word processors six or seven years earlier, my novel would have been different. There would have been no Brazil, and from my point of view, it would have been a great loss. The island of the day before was based on a series of temporal constraints. For instance, I wanted my hero, Roberto, to be in Paris at Richelieu's death, December 4, 1642. Was it narratively necessary for Roberto to be present at Richelieu's death? Not at all. My story would have been the same. But I like that. I like to have him at the Richelieu's bed, and I like to have this constraint. When I introduced that constraint, I didn't have any idea about its possible function. Simply, I liked to represent Richelieu on the verge of dying. It was simply sadism. But that constraint obliged me to solve a puzzle. Roberto had to arrive at his island in August of the following year, because in that month I visited those islands and I was, I was able to describe sunrises and nocturnal skies only at that season. It was not impossible that a sailing ship went from Europe to Melanesia in six or seven months. But at this point, I have to face a tremendous difficulty. I needed that after August, somebody found a diary of Roberto on what remained at the ship that hosted him. But Tasman reached probably the Fiji island before June, that is, before Roberto's arrival. This explained the insinuations I made in the final chapter to persuade the reader that perhaps Tasman had passed twice through the archipelago without registering the second visit in his log book so that both author and readers are pulled to imagine silence, conspiracies, ambiguities, or that at that island docked Captain Bly when escaping from the bounty mutiny, a more fascinating hypothesis and a fine and ironic way to merge together two textual universes. My novel is depending on many other constraints, but I cannot reveal all of my secret for nothing, and we have said that in order to write and we have said that in order to write a successful novel, one needs unrevealed recipes. As for Baudolino, I said that I want to start the story with Constantinople in flames, and Constantinople was conquered in 1204. Considering that Baudolino forged the letter of Prester John and took part in the foundation of Alessandria, I was obliged to make him born around 1142, so that in 1204, he was already 62 years old. In this sense, the story was obliged to start from the final point with Baudolino telling his past adventures through a series of flashbacks. No problem. But Baudolino was in Constantinople on the way back from the kingdom of Prester John. Now, the false letter of Prester John was, historically speaking, forged or diffused about 1160. And in my fiction, Baudolino writes it to convince Frederick Barbarossa to move toward that mysterious kingdom. 
So even considering that at least 15 years or so were spent by Badolino for reaching the kingdom, staying there and escaping from among thousands of adventures, he couldn't start his pilgrimage before 1198. Also consider that historic, it is historically demonstrated that Barbarossa moved to East only in that year. Then, what the hell did I have to make Baldolino to do between 1160 and 1190? 30 years. Why he didn't, st why he didn't start his exploration immediately after having diffused the letter? It was a bit like the business of the computer in Foucault's pendulum. Thus I made him to do many things and I constantly made him to delay his departure. I had to invent a series of accidents in order to arrive finally at the end of the century. Yet, it is only in doing so that the novel creates, not only in Baudolino, but also in the readers, the spasm of desire. Baudolino wants the kingdom, but constantly has to postpone his journey is search. Thus, Prester Jones' kingdom grows in Baudolino longing and in the reader's eyes, I hope. And that's one more, one of the advantages of construction, uh, con constraints. My listener have probably understood that in writing I always took into account the reaction and the collaboration of my reader, a problem with which I did better in the course. I have dealt uh, in the course of many of my, uh, my, my book. I do not belong to that ga gang of bad writers who say they write only for themselves. The only things that the writers write for themselves is the shopping list that helps one to remember what to buy, buy and then can be thrown away. All the rest, uh, including the laundry list, which is written from the launderer, the shopping list is only for me. The laundry list is also for the launderer. Is a message addressed to somebody else. All the rest is not a monologue, it's a dialogue. Now, some critics have found this tangshated in my novel a typical postmodern feature, namely double coding. I was aware from the beginning, and I wrote in my reflections on the name of the rose that uh, whatever postmodernism can be, and I have never exactly understood what the hell it exactly is, I was using at least two typical postmodern techniques. One is intertextual irony, that is, the direct quotations from other famous texts, so more or less transparent references to them. The second is metanarrative, that is a reflection that the text carries out on its own nature, when the author speaks directly to the reader. Double coding is, at the same time, a case of intertextual irony and of, of implicit metanarrative appeal. The expression was coined by Charles Jenks in the speaking of modern architecture, for whom modern postmodern architecture speaks on at least two levels at once, to other architects and the concerned minority who care about specifically architectural meanings, and to the public at large, or the local, local inhabitants, who care about other issues concerned with comfort, the traditional building, and the way of life. The postmodern building or work of art addresses simultaneously a minority elite public using high codes and the mass public using popular codes. To make a, a simple example of double coding in a novel, let me mention the name, the name of the rose uh, that begins by telling how the author came, came across an ancient medieval text. It is a blatant case of intertextual irony since the topos, the literary commonplace of the rediscovered manuscript, is of venerable antiquity. The irony is double and results in being also a meta-narrative suggestion 
since it tells that the manuscript was available to a 19th century version of the original manuscript, a remark that justifies some elements of neo-Gothic novel certainly present in the story. The naive of popular readers cannot enjoy the narrative that follows it unless having taken into account that game of Chinese boxes of sources, which confers on the story an aura of ambiguity. But if you remember, the title of the page we talks about the manuscript is entitled Naturally a Manuscript. That naturally should have a particular effect on the sophisticated reader, who cannot ignore that they are by now dealing with the literary topos, and that the author shows his anxiety of influence, since, at least for Italian readers, the reference is intended to be to the greatest, uh, greatest novelist of the Italian 19th century, Alessandro Manzoni, who begins his uh, The Betrothed, quoting as a source a 17th century manuscript. How many readers could grasp the ironic resonances of that naturally? Not so many, since a lot of them wrote to me asking if my manuscript really existed, and they still continue to do that. But if they have not grasped the allusion, will they still be able to have access to the rest of the story without losing much of its flavor? I think so. Simply they have lost an additional wink. I admit that in implementing this double coding technique, the author establishes a sort of silent complicity with the smart reader and that in some and that some popular readers, even though they don't catch the cultivated allusion, feel that there is something that escapes them. I think that literature are not the sole purpose of entertaining and consoling people, but also the function of provoking and pulling people to read twice, and maybe more, the same text, in order to understand it better. Thus, I think that double coding, it is not an aristocratic tick, but also a form of a way of respecting the brightness and the goodwill of the reader. I suspect that attracted by a title like How I Write, some naive people came here today in order to know how to write. It was a mistake. Usually when a naive youngster asks me what he or she should do in order to become a writer, I answer, don't write the telephone. Uh, and then I have the secretary. Uh, obviously, this is a joke. But it also means that there are no recipes to tell someone how to write. At most, one tell, as I did to today, how I did right, which is a totally different matter. In fact, I should have entitled my speech, How Did I Write? Maybe tomorrow I should write differently. I am convinced that if my novel were published 10 years before, 10 years later, it would have not obtained the same response they got. Thus, the only advice I can give a young person who wants to start write, writing is red. For the older ones, it's too late. <laughs> yeah, three, three. Thank you very much, Professor Umberto Eco, for a very inspiring lecture. And uh, now it's time for questions. This is on Haik, Esitada Kusimusi, Need Vui Vesitada, Ni Esti Kui Inglise Keeles, Aga Kindlasti Tuleks Need Esitada Mikrofoni. Selleks Ettelk Saks Tõlkida Siis Vajadusel. Mikrofoni on meil siin keskel üks, Ja siis on meil liikuvaid mikrofon on kaks, Üks on seal ja üks on seal. Nii siis. Aluks küsimusi. 
ajaga ka julgelt käsi püsti, et ma teid näeks. Ja... I must apologize. I finished it saying red. No, it was an imperative. Read. Sorry. My, my tongue was tired. Küsige julgesti. Tagasi hoidlikus ei ole antud juhul voorus. Ja me näeme ühte küsimust sealt taga kaugel ukse peal. Palun. Maestro, la langue francais e bail. Water langue italiana e bail. Pourquoi parlez-vous anglais à notre fest? Je parle anglais parce que on m'a dit qu'ici, il y avait beaucoup de gens qui parlaient très bien français comme vous et je voulais être méchant. Ni. Merci, monsieur. Kas kuskil ukse taga on järsku keegi, kes ei saa hästi sisse, kes tahaks küsida? Ja on üks küsija, palun. Ma olen Veera Paramunova, ma elan Peepsi järvel, et Peepsi laik. Minu nimi on Veera. Vai vind Siin Eestis Help me please Ja võite Eesti keeles väga vabalt küsida Jah, see tõlgitakse ära Miks Tull Tee siia Eestise Nüüd See aeg Zanislo Miks tull on siin Umberto Eko? Ah, to meet a lot of old new friends because I belong to the category of wandering scholars. Yes, yes, of course. My name is Mario Lutzotak. I'm professor for legal history by the Faculty of Law. And I think, thank you, wonderful lectures from today and from yesterday. I know why do, why do you need your novels or creative writing? Uh, I think it's for me also quite, quite clear why we did need semiotics in the Soviet time. Uh, it was the way of free thinking, so, so much different to the, to the official trials of Hegel and Karl Marx and so similar to the Bain Mult nõutakse, et ma räägiksin eesti keeles. Ma võin jätkata eesti keeles. Semiotika oli oma binaarse struktuuri ja täpsusega väga sarnane Immanuel Kanti filosoofilisele traditsioonile ja sellega kohe ka vabaduse filosoofiale. Pärast nõukogu taja lõppu ma ei vaja enam semiotikat. Mul on vabadus mu oma teaduses. Ja nüüd on minu küsimus, miks vajasite teie semiotikat 1960. ja 70. Itaalias ja miks te vajate semiotikat täna? Ah, to be crude, I could answer because as a professor of semiotic, I receive a salary. <laughs> and I had the two children to crying and starving and I had to nourish them. Uh, second, because there are people who become dancers, or they become criminals, or they become pedophiles, or they become expert in Chinese literature, and I went to semiotics. 
to ask me why to semiotics would be the same as asking me why did you marry that lady and not another one? It's none of your business. <laughs> Nii, sellele küsimusele saadi siis selge otsekohane vastus. Palun veel küsimusi. ja palun. ja mikrofoni paluks. Hea ma palun vabandus või pole see on mingi rumal küsimus. Ma lugisin teie artikliid ja seal, no me saame aru, mõned politikarektsed sõnad on on vaid inetud, aga kas politikarektsus on üldse vajalik või ei ole? Kuidas teie mõtlete? But you said that you read my article, but since I write hundreds of articles, I don't know which one. Put, put a footnote, please. It's on net article, it's on Kirjutunut, Italia Kieles, and Italia Aelechte des Trükki, published. Ja seal oli vaat, see sama, kus oli kirjutunud, et naised, no, eeskujud olid niisugused, et naine on politikarektne, see on genderna abdilionne ja valgi inimene on milanina nidastatečne. Vaat, ma ei tea, kuidas see on eesti keeles. No see, no. see on no. niisugune, niisugune näitus, et äh, valgi on see, kellel puudub melanin. <laughs> why, why person? <laughs> no. Mm. I never written on pigments. <laughs> no, I remember no, no, to have... Uh, tilge, tilge, tuleb, I yeah. have uh, <laughs> remember to have written many, many times on political correctness. Uh, I think that... Uh, the final sense of the whole story is that every group has the right to be called as they like, and so we have to be politically correct in this sense. But I have also spoken about reactions to politically correctness in, in the United States. Uh, I think it is there. No, there's another one. <laughs> Ah. Ah, 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 a propos of how Berlusconi spoke of Obama? No. no. Ah. So I, I, don't, I don't remember which uh, nuance uh, are you picking, uh, picking, uh, picking up. No, I remember to have written about uh, the uh, obvious exaggeration of political uh, correctness uh, in America. There is now a, a site uh, on, uh, entirely on the exaggeration on politically correct as one where they say that they put um, bright signals on the highways. <laughs> but but uh, okay, I, I, I am very respectful of, of the problem of politically correct. So I, I don't know what, I, what you are quoting. A good, uh, a good um, academic way to make question is to arrive with a quotation photocopy. Nii, mulle tundub, et täh, et üks küsimus on kindlasti veel tulemas. Ja palun. Professor Eko, thank you for everything I have read in Estonia and because it was really delighting. We all enjoy your novels. We love you. But my question is, you are, I think, the most outstanding writer of historical novels today, but have you ever had any will to write a historical drama? And if not, then why? Thank no. You. No. I, but why? Uh, for the same reason, I never escalate the Everest. I don't play saxophone. <laughs> I am not homosexual. As I said once, Ars Longa Vita Brevis. <laughs> Taga ukse juures normes roolist varukatega. Mulle oleks selline küsimus, et te olete kirjutanud näiteks. <laughs> Ilu ja inetus ajal on raamatud näiteks ja seal olete kasutanud näiteid popkultuurist. Et ka, kuidas te ennast selle valdkonnakursis hoiate? No, näiteks, kas te olete selliseid märgilisi filmi nagu 
Rambo või Terminator või? Yes, and so? Yes, I've seen some of them, yes. Kas siis nagu eesmärgi päraselt nagu ka püüate kõigega nagu kursis olla? Noh, et kui te kirjutate noh, selliseid üldised ajalugusid. No, I understand the point. I have written about mass media since 1964 with my Apocalyptic Integrati. I have analyzed many comic books and movies, etc. Then I have written on beauty and, uh, and ugliness, but they have nothing to do with, uh, with uh, the Terminator, I think. So I, 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 don't see, I don't see what is the problem you are, you are focusing in your mind. No, lihtsalt mõte oli umbes selles, et kui kas te nagu sihipäraselt nagu, kas te peate tähtsaks neid valdkondi ka, et need on ka olulised nad teie loomingus või? Jees. No popkultuur ja see väike, et kas te ei pea seda nagu alamaks või niimoodi, et noh. Listen, even though 50 years ago it was possible to speak generally of popular culture. Today we have not the right to use this term because popular culture is such a vast territory in which you can have masterpieces, uh, trash, uh, to everything. Uh, so uh, popular culture uh, doesn't mean anything. Popular culture is the, is the rock, uh, but it is in the same uh, at the same time, the, the, the comics of Charlie Brown, who is one of the great creation of contemporary literature. There are silly films like Terminator, uh, um, and uh, it was a good decision to take the actor and to put it as a governor of California, so it doesn't make any other movie. Uh, and popular culture is a lot of different things. There are enormous masterpieces and a uh, horrible and disgusting product. I am very attentive uh, to what happens in the world of popular culture. Maybe there is a lot of phenomena that escape me, but uh, yes, I have al always written a view if you look to my bibliography, to the short articles that I publish uh, every week, uh, several, 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 several times, I go to analyze the phenomena of popular culture. Aitäh, veel küsimusi. Nii, kõigepealt üks küsimus sealt, siis teine oli siin. Palun. Um, my question is, um, do you set internal deadlines when you write your books? And uh, if you don't have any deadline of when uh, this part of the book should be finished or the book should be finished, then where do you get the discipline to complete the book? And uh, are there some books lying around that you just have uh, given up on because of that? It, it depends if you are speaking of my novel, of, uh, of um, academic uh, essays and, and so on. For academic stuff, there is frequently a deadline that comes from outside. You have to prepare the paper for the Congress, so and so. And, I, and then you, you, you are you're obliged to, to, to follow uh, a deadline. For narrative, no. I don't have that line. Uh, if it takes 10 years, that's 10 years. If I, if I, in fact, well, I have told maybe once this story, I finished The Name of the Rose quite by accident in my countryside, January the 5th, which is my birthday. Probably I did it maliciously. I could have finished it the day before, but I, I wanted to finish it January the 5th. And at that point, I decided to finish all my novels January the 5th. Uh, so it happened that if the novel was practically finished uh, November 1, I put it in a drawer and I didn't touch it any longer until January the 3rd in order to finish it for uh, January the 5th. Except Baudolino, I finished it uh, in, in August, August the 3rd. Why? It was finished. When, when a book is finished, it's, it says stop, don't go on. And he, 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 or she, the book, is the master. Huh? You have to stop. So I said, well, why? Uh, uh, I finished it in August. Uh, two days later, 
my first grandchild was born. So I realized that that time it was for the birthday, uh, birthday of my, my grandchild, and that's why there is a, a name on the second page of Baudolino, to, uh, to Emanuele. Uh, from that moment on, I, I abandoned any, any decision about one, when to finish a book. So I don't follow deadlines. When I have severe deadlines, like you, you have to send the article for Friday, and since I have always several things to, to, to do and to finish at the same time, I chose to make always the less urgent. Why? Because that gives me a sense of sin and freedom. <laughs> I do what I am not obliged to do. Then at the last moment I also do what I was obliged to do. But first of all, don't, don't do what, I, what you are obliged to do. We are not slaves. Nii siis me oleme jätkuvalt vabad küsimaks küsimusi. Palu. Uh, I have two questions actually. If the first one is uh, how much do you like the film uh, The Name of the Rose? And the other one is uh, how was uh, Baudolino accepted in uh, your hometown, Alexandria? How did the local people like it? Thank you. Uh, for the first uh, question we will get, you will get 10 euros because you are finally the first today to put this question. <laughs> It's a good movie. Fortunately, it has nothing to do with my book, but it is. <laughs> now, I knew from the beginning that um, there is no translation from language or language to visual language. There are adaptation or reinterpretation. Therefore, the movie would have been absolutely different. I knew that my novel was what in America is called the club sandwich, in which you have tomato, ham, cheese, um, then uh, pastrami, uh, olives, and, 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 if you, if you must, and if you if you had to read my book, you, you need one week more or less. So a movie couldn't be a, a club sandwich. A movie must choose pastrami and lettuce, that's all. And so it must uh, let uh, a lot of important things to drop. I knew it from the beginning, so, okay, the movie was excellent in, in his own, and I remained a good friend of Jean-Jacques Hanot, and we meet so frequently. That's all. Niki, the second question was... Okay. Uh, Nii kiiresti pole keegi Tartu Ülikulist kunagi raha teeninud, nagu see praegu käis. Aga palun, järgmine küsimus sealt. Tere, mul oleks kaks küsimust ühe saargielu vallast. Kõigepealt, kuidas sa on kulgen teie võitlus suitsetamisega, kas on õnnestud maha jätta? Ja teiseks selline ebapoliitkorrektne küsimus, et kuidas te suhtute püüdlike ametnike poolt korraldatud nõia jahti suitsetajutada? Aitäh! No, I understood the first question. The answer is I quit smoking five years ago. The second was? Uh, since I, qu since I, I, quick, uh, I, quit, uh, I quit smoking, I am no longer so quick to, to, to understand every question. Paluks teist küsimust veel kord. Ma küsisin, et kuidas te muidu suhtute ka suitsetamise maha jätnuna suitsetajatele korraldatavasse nõja jahti? Yes, yes I, I think uh, it is a pretty, a pretty inquisitorial uh, since uh, there are 
many other things that are very dangerous, uh, like uh, smoking. And please remember that the only ones who saved their life uh, at the Twin Towers were the smokers, who were downstairs smoking out of the office. And then, so you see that at least in one tragic case, uh, Smoking was um, useful, but um, I, I agree on the fact that uh, that um, it's bad to smoke. And uh, if smoking uh, damaged only smokers, I would be against every campaign. Everybody has the right uh, to 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 get a cancer. But since there is the idea that it disturbs other people, okay. I, I understand that the campaign has to be done, even though I insist that we are killing more people by driving a car from here to the station than by smoking a, a cigarette. But, um, I, I am very happy that the questions are more and more uh, close to the literary problems. <laughs> Thank you. Kas on veel küsimusi? Võtaks paar viimast küsimust. Ja, palun. Seal, seal. Uh, I would like to ask how does, because we heard your love of narrative in your lecture and, uh, and how you write the, the fiction literature, literature. But I would like to ask how the skill of narrative have, I don't know, changed or or your life, how uh, how has, for example, how has uh, writing fiction uh, influenced your academic writing, or is it, and, and do you see a connection between skills of narrative and being a very successful person? Uh, my first answer should be no, it has not uh, uh, influenced my critical writing. But I understand that in the, in the books written after my, at least after the third of my novel, I have a lot of narrative examples. <coughs> Gedanken experiments, but under a narrative, if you took a, one of the theoretical books of mine, published more than 10 years ago, Kant and the Platypus, is mainly done of narrations. Imagine that, imagine that, huh? for theoretical purposes, but narration. So in a way, the practice of narration has brought me to, to, to narrativize, so to speak, my, even my my semiotic uh, stuff. Uh, then, as far for the success, you saw, uh, it's evident uh, as, an, uh, as, a, as a scholar, uh, I had uh, 5,000, 10,000 readers. Uh, as a narrator, I had uh, some millions. Uh, it changed uh, my my life in some way. For instance, I cannot go to the opening of our galleries, uh, of uh, theaters, of concerts, because there is immediately some stupid saying, how what do you think of that? So, tell me. So. Thank you. Võimalus viimaseks küsimuseks, ja palun. Te ütlesid, et kuigi kirjanik kirjutab alati teistest inimestest, aga tegelikult ta kirjutab alati endast. Kas teie elus on olnud mõnda sellist situatsioonid, me eksistentsiaalsed või lasu eluohtliku, mille te olete pannud oma romaani või oleks te soovinud panna? No, I don't understand. Um, have, have I had in my life uh, what? Eksistentsiaalsed või väga keerukad Eks... isegi eluohtliku situatsiooni, tähendab see, mingit saatuslik olukorda või eksistentsiaalsed situatsioonid, millist te, te taha, oleksid pannud oma romaani või sooviksid te sinna panna. Te ütlesid, et alati ah, ah. ikkagi kirjanik kirjutab peamiselt ikkagi enda elust kogu aeg, kuigi just kui teistele orienteeritud. Yes, but the, the, 
Both the things can be, can be true, probably. I put in my books uh, some reference to important existential situations. But just because I write for other people, I have forgot what I put there. Once I have given a certain personal experience to a character, it belongs to the character. And I have forgot that it belonged to me. Maybe this is a sort of cure uh, of uh, talking, talking cure, to charge your character with a lot of things that were embarrassing you. Also because I don't believe that a writer is uh, uh, autobiographical. A good writer distributes it so his or her own uh, experience on all the characters of the novel, not only on one. I, I, I think that Perrault put part of himself not only in Little Red Riding Hood, but also on the wolf. Thank you. And uh, now I know that there are dozens and dozens here your uh, uh, fans and, and uh, our, from our audience who like to have signatures in their books. And, uh, I would like to have a table. Yes, you have uh, four tables here. Nii siis on aeg, et kes soovib saada autogrammi raamatusse, kasutage seda võimalust. Palun.